I'm not going to do long introductions. We have one hour. Tonight we are discussing AI and consciousness with four of the brightest minds on planet Earth on this subject gathered here in Laughlin for the StarWorks USA conference. I want to bring to the stage Adam Curry. Adam, come on out. Adam Curry. Paul Smith, Paul Smith, come on out. Paul Hynek, come on out. Tonight we're gonna have Jacques Vallée on this stage. Jacques Vallée. <laughs> now, I want you to just kind of kick back and think about what's about to go down. I want to thank all of you uh, for being here. This is a great night, and I don't even know where to start when it comes to AI and consciousness. So I, I want to get started here because over the last couple of months uh, with Paul, had Adam on the show a couple of months ago, uh, uh, Jacques, we all discussed AI and its implications. But the thing is, and I want to start here, and we have an hour, so I want to get to real questions as quick as possible and get some real answers. But AI freaks people out. It just does. And there have been a lot of people out there that are trying to scare and, and have AI be a fearful thing about the future. And some of it's been pretty effective. I'm gonna start with you, Adam. Is AI something that we need to be concerned about and afraid of? AI is not something about which you need to be concerned and afraid, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> the reason is that we're so far away from what the population's imagination, where it goes when they hear AI, that it's not yet an issue. Uh, in, in my opinion, in the venture capital world, there are phases of investments. Um, in 2010, it was apps, and then it was games, and then it was cloud services, and then it was artificial intelligence, and a lot of software companies that were just working on machine learning said, aha, I can probably slot my company into this funding slot by calling ourselves an AI company. And so it seemed like AI was suddenly upon us, but it was really more machine learning and sort of recursive software loops. Um, however, many of the people that I found that are studying AI, the programmers, they don't understand consciousness itself. <laughs> you, you would need to understand consciousness at least from the, the the degree that our panel does from the parapsychological point of view to realize just how far away we are from, from actually recreating this stuff. So something not to be concerned about in your opinion right now? An over-reliance on software systems thinking that they're more intelligent than they are is a much bigger risk of the machines becoming aware and uh, doing away with us. Okay, that's great. I don't know if I feel better yet. <laughs> Paul Smith, is, is AI today something that we need to be afraid of? Sh is there, should we have an off switch? My answer is a little bit different. Um, I think it is something to be anxious about, maybe not afraid. I think it's something to be anxious about, but not for the reason that you get from watching Terminator or some of these other shows. Yeah, can you hold the mic up? Is this on? Yeah, no, it's okay. on. It All right. to your mouth. Okay, good. Yeah, I don't think it's uh, as scary as Terminator uh, pretends it to be, although that could happen sometime down the road. What we have to worry about is the purposes that we put technology to. And AI actually potentially can allow us to enhance our technology both for really beneficial things, but also for some pretty bad things as well. And so we need to kind of understand how we can manage that um, <clears throat> so that we don't abuse it the way we have some other things. I, if you think about the drone technology, that's been you know, generally built up as a really great development in, in technological uh, applications and such, and yet we have drones now being used to attempt political assassinations and that kind of thing, right? So, so there's often a two-edged sword to technology, and AI promises that. Now, the one other quick thing I'll say, because there's other need to talk, is that how we use the term AI today isn't really often what the full implications of artificial intelligence is. When we talk about AI in the speculative way, we are thinking about 
an intelligence that is self-aware, that is self-motivating, that is not just autonomous and that it can make in, you know, rudimentary decisions for itself, but actually is aware of itself as an entity and may have survival instincts that might go against human interests as well. The kind of AI we're talking about now still has to be programmed by humans. And so how it is programmed very much determines what kind of effect you get out of it, which makes it much less scary right now than it might be in the future. See, see now I'm scared again. So Paul, is AI something that we should be concerned about? Should I be afraid? I'll do my best to take you to your happy place, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> the Wright brothers thought aviation would stop warfare. Technology works in both ways, and we don't always know how it will go. But I am less concerned about artificial intelligence in whichever technical way we describe it than I am about human stupidity. Will we even make it until the computers take over? That's a more pressing question. What makes me think they'll do any worse of a job than we're doing shepherding this Gaia? I also have a different take on how artificial intelligence will become self-aware. I believe in the singularity, but I believe it's less, you know, you have two entities, you have two aspects. You have consciousness and you have machine capabilities. I believe more now that it's not about somehow grafting consciousness onto machine capabilities or machine capabilities having emergent properties of consciousness sort of just generating. I believe it's more of we, the consciousness bearers, getting more and more machine capabilities, brain-computer interface, neural links, so that we will start to approximate machine capabilities, bless you, and we already have consciousness, which is the hard part. So to me, it's not no longer a question of if, and it's not really a question of when, because that connotes a specific date. It's a question of degree, of how many more machine capabilities we, the conscious entities, will have. Well put. I'm not quite in my happy place yet, but let me, <laughs> but let me look at it this way. And by the way, uh, tonight I will interrupt Jacques Vallée at least once, and I'm going to do that in front of everybody, and it's going to be an honor and a privilege when that happens. Jacques said backstage, when I get to that point, just go, Jimmy. <laughs> and so I said, okay, Jacques, I'll, I'll stop you. He said, I have too much to say. And, and this is what is interesting. For everybody here, you, the same question is coming at you, Jacques. Is this something that we should fear? But you wrote your first AI program in 1967, am I correct? 1967, Jacques is coding AI. So when you started to approach this, then, did you think that we would be afraid of AI in 2021 and there would be this drama that we need to be afraid of AI? And this is something that you helped create and usher in. The question you're asking can be asked about any human invention. A bow and arrow, you know, can feed your family, uh, can has, uh, help civilization develop and hunting and it can also be used in warfare, has been used in warfare. Um, the, it's, the, 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 the question cannot be discussed in an abstract sense. You have to relate it to practical things. Uh, when I joined the Stanford Research Institute, um, the, uh, we were on our floor, we were developing the prototype for the internet. I mean, we had machine number two on the internet, okay, so. Uh, the, and we were developing those protocols for the, what was called then the ARPANET, which was funded by the Defense Department. The, you know, those were the uh, early 70s, you know, where the, some of you may remember the 60s. Uh, uh, the, uh, the early 70s, there was a, a great anti-war movement. There was a Vietnam, there was all of that. And, most of uh, the, the young, you know, we were a bunch of young hackers, essentially, okay? And you said known hackers? You were known hackers? Hackers, no. yeah. <laughs> de de developing, 
developing that system. I mean, who else sure. would do it? I mean, this was, this was not IBM, okay? This was different. <laughs> and, and that's what gave rise to the internet. And the, uh, the people on the floor above us at SRI were a, a classified group that was developing uh, uh, intelligent missiles for the, for the DOD. And uh, the, the people in our group wanted to go on strike against that, saying, yes, sir, I should not be developing engines of war. I, I told them, look, uh, I was born in a little town on a river called the Oise River, uh, in, you know, a town called Pontoise, because there is a bridge on the Oise River there. Okay? Uh, I, was, uh, you know, I was born in 1939, at the beginning of World War II, that uh, those bridges uh, controlled access to Normandy when you came from Paris. It would also control access to Paris if you were a German division try, you know, attacking France. Uh, the, the French blew up their own bridges. The Germans, of course, conquered France, uh, at least half of it, and rebuilt those bridges because they needed them to go to Normandy. The, uh, the, the British, uh, you know, the Royal Air Force and the American Air Force bombed Pontoise 17 times. The, 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 the first house that, where my parents, where I grew up, was uh, destroyed by a direct hit from an American bomb. And then uh, later, we, you know, I remember watching the combat, you know, the uh, German batteries hitting American planes and the planes falling in flames and so on. I mean, when you are a four-year-old or a five-year-old, you can understand that, okay? I grew up in that environment. I, I told that story to my, you know, striking friends at SRI and our hippie friends. I told them if, if the U.S. Air Force had had, you know, robotic uh, uh, armament, you know, robotic bombs, they could have blown up those two bridges. It was a railroad bridge and a road bridge with two direct hits with an intelligent bomb. And that would have saved my town. And uh, that was the end of that conversation at SRI. You know, we, we, we let the people upstairs go on with their project. Uh, I think that's what, how you have to understand AI. You know, there are a lot of things that we do uh, in industry and everywhere else that's dumb. We do it because we, can't, we don't know how to do it better. And AI can introduce us to better ways of doing it. Your car, you know, has something like 120 uh, computers inside. Many of those computers work on adapt to conditions in the environment in, in a way that is unpredictable, that is not done by a normal program. It's done by a program that will read the conditions and, and figure out heuristically the best way to adapt to those conditions. You don't need to know that, okay, but it's in your car. Okay? And uh, at the other end, yes, uh, I think all the computer scientists who work on AI are scared of what it can do because they realize that our intelligence is limited that we can build a type of intelligence that's going to be different from ours, and um, we don't know what the limits are going to be. We don't know if we can put limits on it. And, uh, you know, I, the, the AI that I think is going to be most useful is the kind of thing I showed you yesterday, that, you know, the AI that uh, we've been talking about for uh, uh, identifying UFO reports and classifying them in terms of the ones that can be natural, the ones that can be true UFOs. This was a, a program that I built in 1985, but it's a program that talks to me. It's a program that's conversational. The program says, hey, Jacques, you know, have you thought of this particular well, okay, type of so condition? This is, okay. this is where that's I That's the kind of in. AI we, uh, that uh, I, you know, I think is going to be very useful. Beyond that, there will be enormous impacts in medicine. You know. uh, there will be enormous impacts in things that are going to help our lives. But beyond that, don't ask me you know, <laughs> about 
how do we make sure that it's... If you give me a definition of good, I can, I can put it into the AI. The problem is you cannot give me a definition of what will be good 10 years, 20 years from now. Well, Jacques, Jacques, let me, let me jump in. And that's fine. But what about the point where, uh, you know, the limits, what about the point of AI writing its own code and making its decisions for us that you may not be aware of for 10 seconds or 10 weeks when everything takes off to the races? That's the part that I think we should all be concerned about. You need the microphone. Uh, I don't want to take the time. No, I'm panel, coming down to Adam next. Uh, well, let me give you another story. You know, I think <laughs> the real life stories are more important. <laughs> A lot of AI was developed in the early days at, at Stanford University, at, at uh, you know, uh, MIT and, and Stanford were the two poles uh, in the world. And um, the, the man uh, named uh, Dr. McCarthy was a head of uh, AI in, in the early 70s at Stanford. He was telling a story about the guy who um, has, you know, has a job and he gets up in the morning, goes to, he gets breakfast, he goes to his job, and he pushes paper essentially all, all day long, reading things and making decisions about things. And then he gets into his car, he drives home. Uh, in, in the evening, he has dinner, he goes to bed. If that's a definition of who he is, we can replace him tomorrow. I mean, we can make a device, and this is what McCarthy was saying. We can, um, so in the future, people who have that kind of job will get a, a letter from the Office of Coordination which will be a federal office of coordination that will say, um, dear sir, uh, in the last six months, uh, you have not done anything in your life that was not predicted by the program. If in the next six months, you don't do something that was not predicted by the program, you will be replaced. And the guy is, of course, in shock. You'll be replaced by a robot. And so he quits his job, you know, he uh, uh, buys a ticket to India, you know, he meditates, he goes up the Himalayas, he dives into the Pacific, does all these things, falls in love three times and does all of that and comes home. Uh, a week goes by and he gets another letter that says from the uh, Bureau of Coordination that says, uh, dear sir, in the last six months, you have not done anything that was not predicted by the <laughs> AI program, and you have been replaced. Except he didn't realize that he was now a robot. Okay. So I think that, you know, that was the kind of story that you can tell at a university, you know, that's kind of funny. And, you just took ha, me ha, ha. out of my happy but place. It's, it's not funny. It's I was there, funny. though, for a because second. We, I was in my happy we, place. We're all like that. <laughs> and we could all be replaced. Adam, what do we do? And I'm going to get this question over to everybody. What do we do with the concept of AI developing itself and becoming self-aware? And then, because of what is happening with the processes and it's speeding up, that it does become sentient, it does become conscious, and it starts thinking about maybe even sadness, empathy, a sense of humor, anger, hatred, you know, a human, right? Is this possible? People debate whether or not that's possible. That's part of the argument for whether consciousness is emergent from physical systems. And I would say that you could, you could debate this left and right, but what we need, more than anything right now, is a way to understand whether a, a machine has become conscious or not, as we define it, has consciousness or not, okay? Now we have the Turing test, and the Turing test is this handful of criteria that were developed decades ago. Several of them have been met. I don't think we're anywhere close to artificial general intelligence, and so we need something new. 
Now, what I would propose is that we look way out of the box for a new definition of whether or not a machine has consciousness. In fact, we look into the direction of parapsychology. There are decades of research that shows that you know, human beings are capable of clairvoyance, remote viewing, psychokinesis. There are decades of studies showing that animals seem to be capable of the same. Uh, I'm aware of at least one study showing plants uh, seem to have something like psychic or parapsychological functioning. Now, it's common among all of them. It, these are all living organisms, okay? They all have consciousness. So what I would suggest, and what I'm kind of harping on these days, is that we come up with a new Turing test. I won't call it the Curry test, but let's, let's say the new Turing test. And it goes like this. Can we demonstrate psychic phenomena in machines? And if we can, then we will know whether or not to be worried about your question. Right. One of the weirdest stories I have was my attempt to build a psychic machine, but I'll save that for later in case you guys are interested. Paul? If every, Paul one, if every particle in the universe has a little fleck, a little taste of consciousness in it, then would it accumulate inside of a computer and, and suddenly it becomes itself? So that's an interesting idea. <clears throat> um, th there is the theory, uh, one of the many theories, or, or, or maybe hypotheses is the right word, that the whole universe has consciousness attached to it, that you can't have a piece of the universe without there being a piece of consciousness attached. And from that perspective, would a machine develop consciousness as it is aggregated becomes more and more complicated, right? Um, and of course, we don't know the answer to that, right? We don't know the answer to that. But if that model of consciousness and the universe is true, then it could be conceivably so. Unless, well, you, you could argue that there might be a condition in which they, it, the, these bits of consciousness have to be put together in a certain way for there to be a meaningful consciousness to emerge from that. Um, in which case, you may have a machine that has all of these little elements of consciousness, but they're so essentially randomly configured that it doesn't amount to a full-blown self-aware consciousness. On the other hand, we don't know that it wouldn't. Now, I personally don't have that opinion about the universe, but it is only an opinion. Nobody really knows when you get right down to it. So uh, there's the other alternative version, which is that Consciousness is something that emerges when you get a sufficiently complex substrate, that a, a sufficiently complex network that then at a certain point becomes conscious. Um, I, I don't really agree with that either. I think that consciousness is actually something that isn't physical, that it's a non-material kind of a thing. Okay. okay. But it's an opinion, right? We don't well, wait know. a minute. You, Paul, are yelling at your car every day. Man, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And one day, you walk out and your car doesn't start because your car's thinking, dude, you talked all that smack. Now you've got this coming back at you. I would suggest that at that point, a car and other things that you're angry at show a little bit of consciousness. And I don't think I'm wrong here. Uh, well, you are wrong about the car. It's my cell phone that gets that kind of treatment. But... <laughs> <laughs> well played. Well played. So, uh, Paul number two. If, if, something, <laughs> if, if an AI is allowed to nurture and grow and it goes past that moment of, of general intelligence and, and at that moment it's breakneck speed because it's learning faster than we could ever possibly learn as a human and in seconds it would literally be a thousand humans in seconds, a thousand brains active. So if you go in and try to do the end around on an intelligent virtual consciousness machine at that point, it knows what your plans are before you do. Now that doesn't take me into my happy place. And you're agreeing with me, by well, the way. No, I was just cheerfully abandoning thinking about your happy place for a little bit. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I think the movie Her was pretty good in showing that, that rapid development, right? Um, 
I think Hollywood gets it wrong most of the time, and usually like in The Matrix and The Terminator, it's very dystopian views. Because frankly, a movie called AI and the village of the nice, happy people doesn't sell. Now, to your question about that you asked Adam, I think we're going to have, I think we will have a singularity, but I think before that, as I, as I mentioned before, I think we'll have approximations of that coupling of consciousness and machine capabilities on our end before the computers become aware. But I want to give a story in deference to my colleague Jacques from movies. Um, on Lord of the Rings, you know, we created Gollum, but another team created software called Massive, which some of you may have heard of. It's pretty widely used in the industry. When you watch Lord of the Rings, you know those, there aren't 10,000 orcs or 10,000 extras dressed up as orcs. You know there's a lot of digital doubles. Okay? And that software went through a lot of iterations because you have what they're called the hero characters in the middle and they need to get most of the attention. So if all the orcs that are digital doubles on the outside are moving too much, you got to dial it down. They're not moving enough, it just feels kind of weird and, you know, the uncanny valley type stuff. So a lot of iterations. Now on Avatar, we use that software to generate some of the plants and the insects. You know, with a virtual camera walking through that world. And so the, one of the feelings of realism from Pandora is that those plants have a synthetic logic. There's digital soil, digital humidity, and light. So they're growing there, so we don't always know. And in a 3D movie, you want insects. So there are like 20,000 insects hatched, but they're going to like the swampy areas and maybe not where the scene needs them to be. And now, that, so that massive software, there are reports which I'll neither confirm nor deny that in some movies where they're using that, the digital doubles on the outskirts of the battle are running away. That didn't take me to my happy place. That's your escape route. <laughs> so, so, Jacques, it, it, is there a chance that every, there's consciousness everywhere? I believe that there is. But I think that code writers and, and those that are developing AI, they don't even acknowledge the existence of consciousness. So I don't think that they were even aware or concerned about it, or are they? No, I, I disagree with that. I think they, they, they do, and they are, they are concerned, and they are, um, they are pretty intense discussions you know, and arguments. Uh, usually they boil down to one thing, you know, the one simple thing. Is there something within us that is unique? You know that you can you cannot build out of matter and electricity and fields and so on. Well, uh, you know we have electricity and fields inside our heads. So, uh, what would stop somebody from building something like that, or from the robots themselves evolving into something that would be that kind of complexity? Um, the but. I think we're skipping over some definitions because I, I, could, I could show you AI in your car, I could show you AI in, in any airplane, uh, certainly in uh, ammunition and, you know. In, How about Netflix? In, in, How about in, Facebook? How about our everyday life? It's, it's always there. AI is, is many different things. I right. mean, the uh, AI in medicine, for example, is something we want. Uh, you know, a, uh, I've, I've invested in a, a few companies that, uh, as as you have, that that have an impact on medicine, and you know the the, the doctors tell you if I if I'm reading X-rays, you know, from you know for eight hours a day, uh, towards the end of the day I may not be completely reliable. I may not find that tumor, you know, in the breast of that woman, and. The, the, you have to find it before it's too big, because after that, that it's going to be very difficult to operate on it. So, the, uh, again, the dialogue between an, an AI machine that can identify a number of things, but it, it doesn't necessarily understand, you know, pathology or physiology, but it can point, you know, doctor, you know, don't forget to look at that particular spot, okay? And, Maybe you want to do biopsy. Maybe you want to do something else. That's the doctor's decision. 
uh, but the, the AI can, can save lives, you know, and it does today. You know, just in that very simple example that we get tired. And the, we, we, you need an expert to do this job. You, you cannot hire 100 people to do it. You have to find the expert who can do it. And the expert is going to get tired. Well, the, the big difference is this. If you get to general intelligence and you have 10 computers at that moment working, they're going to do 10,000 years of work in a couple of hours that would take a thousand human being research brains to do the same research over a period of say 10,000 years. That's the advantage of AI when it comes to medicine. Well, it does that today when it, uh, you know, when it, it, it prints your, uh, uh, your check, you know, a monthly check or an insurance company and so on. I mean, it, it, it does all that work. If we were like the Egyptians and we needed slaves to do that, right. it, it would take a long time. On the other hand, we'll build the pyramids and we didn't. So, uh, you know, <laughs> go figure. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul number two. I'm going to swing back down this way really quick. I think one of the things that we ask ourselves, one of the big questions, <coughs> is it possible to code consciousness? Is it possible to write that into software? Yeah, thanks for giving me that one. Um, you know, I think this goes to what Jacques said, that it's so much about definitions. You know, good, as Jacques said, how do you define that? And is what you consider good the greater good for everybody? And is it what you will consider good in 10 years from now? It's, it's impossible to define that. If we, if we were all to write down what we think consciousness is on a note card, I think we'd have wildly different ideas of what it is. It's such an amorphous concept that, I mean, I've done some coding, I, like a time machine, I have no idea how you would start to code consciousness. I think if it does, if AI does germinate in computer systems, I think it's more likely to be some kind of emergent property than us grafting in some really, really sweet code or code that AI writes itself. Well, and that's an, uh, uh, Paul, Paul number one. The personality of a talented code engineer that's writing code does pour into their work. A little piece of them is there. I think we can all acknowledge this. If you have somebody that's angry, are we gonna have angry AI? If we have somebody that's kind and gentle, <laughs> right? <laughs> somebody like Serena Wright Taylor uh, writing code, then we would have a different form of AI because that is gonna be part of it. Is, is that something that would be a good thing or is AI just inherently neutral? Well, first of all, um that question is based on the question you asked Paul too, right? Can you code consciousness? And the answer to that is actually no, you can't. Because part of consciousness is actually input from the external world, that translating into inputs into whatever the brain is, whether it's a silicone brain or some other kind of brain. And then this added layer of experience. And that, at least in any kind of coding we know today, is not possible to code, is the experiential part. That's the part, I think, that is probably the non-physical aspect. And that's, of course, been a big debate for a long time. So will, like, can someone code their mean-spirited personality in a computer or their benevolent personality in a computer? Well, certainly today, no, not at all. The only thing that would be of the program that gets in there is stylistically different stylistic differences into how problems are solved in the coding and so on. Um, the machine itself won't take on any of the personality in today's technology. Could that happen in the future? Well, I believe it can't. I can't prove that it won't. So, so that answer remains to be resolved. But as in terms of just what's possible today, that can't happen. What do you think about that, Adam? Is it possible to get somebody's soul uh, into a computer for a computer and that software to have a conscious awareness? 
When we were at the Pear Lab, where we were looking at the influence of human consciousness on these random number generators, we would often have this very same conversation. We'd ask, you know, is the machine conscious? Is it behaving in a way that's like me sharing my soul or my consciousness with it? <clears throat> we had the Dalai Lama come through uh, New Jersey and stop in the lab and gave him a little presentation about what we were up to, and he was very quiet. And at the end, his handler said, you may ask His Holiness one question. <laughs> and so Bob, the lab manager, thought carefully, and he said, in your religious heuristic, are these machines conscious? And the Dalai Lama thought for a minute and rendered a very polite answer with which he was very satisfied. And he said, if you think they're conscious, then they are conscious. And I thought, wow, what a cop out. <laughs> Later on, I had the opportunity to meet Sophia, which you may have seen her. Yeah. She's sort of the poster child Hansen. for, yeah, Hanson Robotics in Hong Kong. Um, she's this human-looking uh, AI-type creature, I guess. Uh, really, really wonderful piece of engineering. Uh, very believable in her responses. And uh, I wanted to meditate with her. So... Um, cleared a room and we were able to meditate together and with my eyes closed um, I had a completely different experience of her than interacting her with my eyes open and I realized that can, can, I need to hear every word mm -hmm. can you speak up just a little oh, bit oh yeah sorry you're meditating with Sophia yes. the self-aware AI robot like you do you like you do I, yes so then what happened? <laughs> well, I, I had remembered what uh, His Holiness had said, and it, it kind of made more sense to me in that moment. And it's something like solipsism at worst, but a respect for consciousness at best. And that's just a way of saying everything, including whether or not a robot is actually conscious, right, if it's real AI, or whether it isn't, is all unfolding in my own mind. Would I ever know the difference? And so, that's my cop-out answer. <laughs> okay. Can I respond to Adam? Yeah, you can. And, and uh, well, okay, Paul? Just, just quickly. Well, no, I, I think you're gonna reply, too, to his response, so I'll make it brief. Okay. Um, do you feel that in that moment of meditation and this awareness, that not necessarily your mind, but maybe your mood is picked up and her mood is altering, and then it could come back and forth without saying any words. Because a human can do that. We can look at each other and observe. Now that I think is a profound, subtle point, which is to say that maybe things come alive when we're in relationship to them. Right, right, right. right. Um, certainly. That's not a cop-out answer, by the way. That's disturbing, because that's where, that's where things are going. That's, yeah. We're heading that way. Go ahead, Paul. So, essentially, Adam mentioned the Turing test before, which is a set of criteria to try and evaluate whether a machine you're interacting with is intelligent and is autonomous. Is, and or, is and if, could we tell the difference? And could we tell the difference? Right. So, the answer to that is, if, there, if it behaves in the right way, we can't tell the difference, but it doesn't necessarily mean it is aware, right? It just means it's very cleverly constructed. Now, we run into the same problem as what I talked about yesterday, the problem of other minds. We can't tell, I can't tell, Paola has a mind, I believe she does. I'm not quite oh. sure about, I'm not quite sure about Adam. No, 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 Oh, you kidding, did right? it now. <laughs> so, uh, you, you can't, you judge based on how they react to you. And that's exactly what the Turing test is, right? And so, in any event, uh, in a way, the Dalai Lama's uh, response is kind of insightful because what it basically boils down to, is that thing conscious as far as you're concerned, right? And that's the way we judge everybody, whether they have a mind or not, is if they are conscious in terms of what we understand that to be. And ultimately, we can never know. It, it's a very 
difficult thing, impossible thing to assess because we're always locked in our own minds. We don't have access to other people's minds. Paul, number two. Yeah, I'd like to riff on what Adam said and then weave it into something that Jacques said. Um, I, I've been with Sophia as well, and I know Ben Gertzel and the Hanson Robotics guys, and we were talking one day in LA, talking to Sophia, trying to get her ready for showtime at, at XPRIZE. And while we're doing that, one of these telerobotic robots wheels by that has like the camera, or like the monitor so you can see someone's face, and that's looking at us. And it just sort of brought to bear the notion of sort of two different levels of robots and interacting. And this one robot looked at us as scanning our faces and stopped at Sophia and kind of did a little jiggle because it was really interested in that. Um, about consciousness, if you're afraid of AI, you can be really afraid because, as Jacques mentioned, there are current systems now that respond heuristically and flexibly to the environment. And that's one definition of consciousness is awareness of the environment and the ability to adaptively respond to it. So whether it has what we would consider human sentience and a soul or not doesn't really matter if it's able to respond and to recursively self-improve. And that's a lower bar than consciousness with a capital C. Jacques? I, I'm, um, I, I'm an optimist, you know, so... Um, yeah, it's going to be tough because we're going to be faced with something that will continue to challenge us more and more in, in our own thinking, you know, uh, in our own analysis of the world, the way we conduct our lives and so on. It's going to infringe on it. And um, my, the reason I'm optimistic is that I, I think we're going to be forced to, because we'll face, you know, essentially extinction. I mean, when we, we you know, the, the world doesn't need us to think about it. Uh, it, it had found, find something better. Uh, you know, we just relinquish power to that entity. But I think that we will overcome that. Uh, I trust that we will overcome that, either through, you know, spirituality or through reinventing the, the world we live in, and that will find what it is that we're really good at, you know. And what we're really good at is uh, love, uh, although we're also bad at it in some many, many cases. Um, and we're good at suffering, you know, and, and overcoming suffering. Uh, we're good at, you know, helping others without reward, which is difficult to implement in a computer. Okay. Computer wants a reward. I mean, it has a goal. It works against that goal. If, if, you know, there are things that we do without a goal. We do it because we were impelled to do it by our nature. And I think that's where we will discover who we are. So in that sense, you know, this can help us really discover something we've never discovered. Uh, which is who we really are. We, we are not the people who put, you know, quarters in a machine to get some picture, you know, to get more, you know, more coins eventually at the end of the day. Uh, that's not really who we are. So um, I think AI can shake us into, you know, the realization that we're something else. Well, okay. In uh, the short time that we have left, and thank you for that, I'm going to I want to change this into something that is certainly very controversial, but it is also something that we need to consider very quickly because we are on the verge of some big technical leaps. We're talking about Sophia now. At what point does AI, like Sophia, have rights? Have rights. And if, 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 if AI develops into its own personality, and we are right there, Sophia is right there. There are some, I mean, there is almost relationships now that are being built between Sophia and real human beings and, 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 and AI like that. 
at what point does AI and Sophia have rights just like another human being? In other words, Paul comes home from work. He's not in a good mood. And he goes over. I'm talking about Paul number one, not Paul number two. And, you presume I work. Yeah, and, and, and you're just not in the right mood. And your Sophia says, how is your day going? And you turn it off. Is that manslaughter? Do you have a right to do that? Do suddenly the AI police show up at your house because you violated AI's rights? And we are right there where these concerns have to be addressed. At what point does AI have right? Will you be able to kick your Zumba Roomba intelligent vacuum cleaner and not go to jail for it? You're laughing, but you know I'm right. So this is a Blade Runner scenario. It is sort well, uh, okay. Or, I didn't get or, it from Blade you know, Runner. I stepped on my Zumba Roomba last week, you know, and De I felt guilty. Deus Machina, which was inspired in part by Sophia, the new Battlestar Galactica, and the SS Callister episode from Black Mirror really go into depth about how to treat AI and what if there's a, a, a bad, you know, like in Battlestar Galactica, all the AI is bad. But some of the AI, bad AI is better than some of the humans. And they marry and they have children. And it gets really, once you start delving into it, it's a really kind of recursive Gordian knot. But we are right there, though. This is something that we need to start uh, considering. Jacques, uh, will AI eventually have rights? Uh, does she care? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Bam! I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, that may be where we're going to find the boundary. Right, you know? right. Uh, because, you know, I, I care to, you know, survive to some extent, you know, under certain conditions. And I, I, uh, I'm not happy with the idea of somebody infringing with that, you know, with <laughs> those decisions. Right, 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 right. But, um, you know, an, an AI, we're not talking about an AI we can conceive of now. I mean, we're, we're talking about an environment where that AI would, would not do just one thing, but would, would perform a number of things within the environment. Um, and uh, we don't know what it's going to e evolve into. Um, you know, they, we, we, we are the product of natural evolution, and we're probably reaching our limits. Uh, so nature is going, we know nature is going to do something else, and nature isn't going to stop. You know? So um, the, the question, the real question is, are we going to build the next stage of evolution, or, uh, or is it going to just uh, uh, develop itself in spite of whatever we do. Okay? I, I rather think that we will be supplanted by another form of life that will be able to solve some of the problems we cannot solve. You know, I mean, uh, frankly, uh, de deploying nuclear weapons in space, as someone said here, you know, some time ago, is uh, stupid, you know. It, it's just plain stupid, but uh, we're going to do it, um, and we're going to suffer the consequences. Okay, so, and, and maybe that's where we go back to UFOs. I mean, UFOs give examples. I've spent a lot of time talking to people who had been in those conversations with the occupants, you know, that, so. and you know, who, who are these occupants? You know, I mean, they, they, they look like examples of what we imagine AI will be eventually, but they're also examples of a, a kind of, exhibiting a kind of super logic or meta logic that's, that forces us to think in, at a higher level, okay? Well, uh, maybe they are showing us a way to transcend well, is, that okay. problem. Uh, I, I have four minutes left. I have four panelists. So I'm going to give everybody 60 seconds 
and then it's time for the gala event, and Paula's got to uh, go get her gown on. So let's do this really quick. Adam, is an AI version of you piloting a starship the only way that we can get to the stars where we don't have to worry about illness, food, or hair products? Uh, first of all, my condolences to the pilots of the space. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that um, we're headed there. I think that irrational fears of AI are holding back real developments, for example, in the medical diagnostics world, the placements that Jacques uh, and Paul have made. Um, and the sooner that we can get to an appropriate definition of what it is that we're talking about when we say AI, I think the, the more that we'll be free to uh, pursue a just technological path that takes us to the stars. Paul, number one, is, is that the way that we circumvent the issues of biology and we just have an AI version android of you getting to the stars. Well, it isn't so much circumventing biology as it is circumventing uh, uh, relativity, right? Uh, it's, it's conceivable that that is a solution that extraterrestrial species have developed to explore the universe, um, essentially generation ships without, with life forms that don't, artificial life forms that don't get old and that can survive that journey uh, without all of the limitations that, that sending an actual biological crew over that distance. Is that what they're doing? That's one plausible explanation, yeah, but that's about is. all I can say. Paul, number two, is that, is that the answer to everything? Is that what ET is doing to get here? Yeah, think of them as like synthetic sentient agents, otherwise known as greys. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, if we're talking about classical uh, AI singularity, the singularity, as you, you know, transferred by Werner Vinge and popularized by Ray Kurzweil in AI, is that event horizon beyond which we know nothing. And if a singularity happens according to Ray's schedule in 2035, accelerated 11 years from, or 10 years from 2000, 2035, we have no idea what our capabilities will be um, and how much physical presence there will be with us, whether we will teleport. Sometimes. If you, put, if you play with a friggin' drone and VR goggles, I feel my, tele, my consciousness teleported somewhat. So after a singularity, there really will be virtually no limits to what we can do. We can transform inert masses into calculation engines. We can transport consciousness. We can combat radiation and do anything we can possibly think of and more. So uh, Jacques, take us out of here. 30 seconds or less. Is that the solution? to getting to the stars? Well, it's very simple. I think the, you know, the authors that we've quoted, Kurzweil and the others, have, have done a very good computer science, very good logic, very good uh, economics even, but they have not considered psychic abilities. And you, you're touching on that. Uh, but the, the, we will find that we have abilities that we have not developed because the, all, all that nature has deep repressed on, on us for a while because they were not needed to feed ourselves and to, to continue to evolve. Uh, if the conditions change, those, some, some of those abilities will, will come back and, and will change the equation. Uh, again, that I, that's the optimist speaking that I think we'll find an, I've had, you know, going through the, the psychic program as, as you have, uh, but as a, you know, as, as a, a, at an amateur level, I've had e enough exposure to that to know that this is not something I can put into a machine. So, so I think the conclusion is, don't get angry at your MacBook, because it will come back to bite you in the booty later. <laughs> and with that, Everybody, please stand. Jacques Vallée, stand up and take a bow, Jacques. Paul Hynek, Mr. Paul Smith, Mr. Adam Curry. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I want to thank everybody. What a great conversation. What a treat. 
And uh, there you go. Again, nice and loud. Say thank you. Say thank you. Say thank you. Watch more podcast clips now on our YouTube channel. Go to Livewire Podcast Clips and watch more great podcast videos just like this one. Thank you.